It's a real battle that Bitcoin companies have and still have now. I mean, it's every, every founder I've spoken to has talked about all the difficulties and um, they're quite unique as well. Uh, I mean, firstly, security, you have the honeypot that people want to attack. Uh, I've spoken to many exchange owners about you know, the challenges of constantly defending yourself of the, all different types of attacks. Um, and when we saw Twitter attacked recently, um, you have difficulties with banking, difficulties with fundraising, convincing people that Bitcoin is something, uh, difficulties with regulations, with scaling. There's so many difficult, so many challenges. Do you think this is, is this all tech companies or do you think this Bitcoin world is just even, even harder? Just like, it's a much harder beast to crack. Mm. Well, I mean, look, there's no startup out there that I've heard of that's easy or that was easy to start. I think there's kind of um, this narrative that people apply when they, they see something that's just really starting to work and they don't see the five or 10 years of failure that went that preceded that. Right. Um, there's almost no company that I'm aware of, like, you know, the Airbnb story, th those guys were crazy to have continued working on that. They were like in tons of credit card debt, every setback you could imagine. The thing was not working. They were like three years into it and broke and like they should have given up and they didn't and it eventually worked, right? Um, pretty much every startup, if you look at it, there's some kind of um, heroic feat slash stroke of good luck that manages to make it work. And I think crypto companies are no exception. That's, that's true. I would say that was true for us as well at Coinbase. I mean, uh, we had a stroke of good luck in the sense that the timing was right. You know, we had started working on it at, and then we had, a, we wrote a couple of those waves when things really wanted, got crazy and people wanted a place to buy it. They, we were it, but there was also um, some moments that they could have gone the other way. You know, I, I like I look back and like the very early days of Coinbase, there was a couple coin flips where if it had gone the other way, like maybe we wouldn't exist um, now. So can, can some you dig into were, any of those? <laughs> well, some of them were either, fundraising events, right? That was like, if we hadn't gotten that one person to say yes, we probably would have not been able to hire and we would have shut down. Um, you know, some of them were bank partners that we landed that were keeping, kind of helping keep that revenue coming in. Um, <clears throat> there was some definitely security is a huge one, right? Like the early days of Coinbase, there was all kinds of people attacking um, and we were a lot, a lot less um, probably, you know, thoughtful and, and had all the systems in place that we do today. Over time, we got more and more on kind of layers of security in place and teams and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But in those early days, I mean, yeah, we had like one of our customer support accounts got taken over and, you know, it could have been a really bad outcome, but um, we managed to, you know, save the day. So there were some kind of crazy moments like that, for sure. Have you have you felt a lot of pressure during it? Have there been times when it's almost got overwhelming? <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I mean, so I think one of the key features or one of the key skills of being an entrepreneur is actually like this kind of resilience or determination. Um, some people have commented to me that, um, you know, I'm like a pretty even keeled person. <laughs> so I do, I do feel the stress and I feel like highs and lows, but I think there's something weird about my personality where I'm like, I, I don't feel the highs as high as everybody else, but I also don't feel the lows as low as everybody else. So I'm able to just kind of keep going. And part of that is a cultivated mindset. I think part of it is just kind of how the way I, the way I am naturally. Um, but yeah, there, there were some really dark days there where I remember like, um, you know, we, we'd have some bug on the website and thousands of customers would be angry. And then, um, you know, my head of engineering would quit and we'd get some lawsuit in the mail from someone trying to sue us for a million dollars. And um, all these things happen kind of at the same time. And there'd be day, a, lot of, a lot of days, I'd say like the first four years of Coinbase, you know, Fred Ersham and I were working 12 hour days, six days a week, um, trying to just will this thing into existence. And it often felt like, you know, if we, um, we were, we were answering customer support queries, you know, until two in the morning and trying to go home and get four hours of sleep, we'd get woken up in the middle of the night, the website's down, you know, I, I was on pager duty for many years. Um, and there was a lot of sleep deprivation. Um, and there was a lot of just like grit to see if we could try to will this thing into existence. But I would say over the years, it's gotten a little easier. Um, there's always some new thing that comes in like, of course, side, side swipes you. But um, so there's never, there's always something new to learn as a CEO. But yeah, there's been a lot of dark days. Um, and you also, I think one of the key things was securing the, the banking 
agreement with Silicon Valley Bank. That seemed to be a pivotal kind of moment for the company because I know a lot of companies struggled with banking. Um, yeah. I've spoken to a lot of people who run exchanges have talked about that. Um, yeah, I spoke to uh, Jed very early on about what, what he was doing, where he was having to use his own private bank account uh, yeah. with Mt. Gox. Um, you seem to almost have like a, a two-year monopoly on, on that relationship with that bank how helpful was that and how did that all come about how did that all come about yeah so i think that was really important for coinbase's success um you're right there was a period there where i think we were the only kind of viable way to probably buy cryptocurrency in the u.s and we gained a lot of traction during that time and you know the way that that came about is that um once we realized people wanted to actually buy crypto on the site i realized we needed to get a partnership with the bank so people could add their bank account or eventually credit cards and debit cards and things and so actually Y Combinator made an intro to Silicon Valley Bank. Mm -hmm. And we went and found, uh, we talked with them. And I remember calling them up and saying, hey, I'd love to get like kind of an ACH access, which is the banking rails in the US. And, and they said, okay, well, you know, what's your AML policy? And um, I was kind of like Googling, you know, live on the call, like, what is an AML policy? <laughs> um, and I was like kind of skimming the Wikipedia article, right? And so I realized at a certain point, I was like, you know, we need to get um, some of these systems and controls in place. That's the only way we're going to get these features live. And so we started to, we went out and hired um, a chief compliance officer. You know, we, we spoke with a couple of law firms that um, kind of helped us think about money transmission licenses and all these kind of things. And you're always in this weird place as a startup, right? Because you, you're not going to have time and, and resources to go build the systems to the way that a large company would. If you took, you know, if we had waited to get all 50 money transmitter licenses or whatever, it would have been um, three years and millions of dollars, right? And we had only raised 600K. So we needed to get started with something. And um, we were able to kind of get some legal opinion letters written, things like that, and enough of a um, control environment in place that the bank felt comfortable starting us with something, right? And we then went through some growth spurts, um, which were honestly like very uncomfortable for them. I think. I remember we'd get these calls from the bank and they'd be like, you're, you have $500,000 in the bank account and you did $500,000 in volume yesterday of Bitcoin buys. So if you have like one mistake one day and somehow you can't collect the money, you're, you're insolvent as a company. And we were like, yes, that's true. <laughs> and their response was, you need to get some more money in this bank account or we're going to turn off your access in 30 days. You know, that, those kind of conversations. And so, you know, Fred, Fred, or, Fred Orson and I went at that point, we were like, all right, let's go raise a Series A. And we went out there and it was a good story to tell investors like, hey, we're growing so fast, like we need capital or the bank's going to turn off our account. And we were able to get um, that initial Series A raised with five million. And there was many moments like that where um, we, we had a lot of working capital challenges of like just trying to keep the Bitcoin buys on during that mm -hmm. time. But ultimately, <laughs> working with Silicon Valley Bank did help us get off the ground and um, it put a lot of strain on their systems too. I think they were getting a lot of people internally saying, you know, what the hell is this Bitcoin company that's growing like a weed? And like, do we even want to be involved in this? What are the compliance risks? And I know when their auditors were coming to audit their bank, they were kind of leaning on them. Like, what the hell is this client you have? And so ultimately we had to get a, move to other banks and eventually work with some of the biggest banks out there in the world. But that took, you know, seven years of like trying to build a team and the relationships and the rigor around these systems that um, would get those bank partners comfortable. And am I right? You've raised about half a billion in total now. Yeah, that's about yeah. right. So one of the things I, I, one of the first questions I have written down for you, actually, I think it might have been the first one I wrote down is what kind of pressure does that come with? Because I think that's a really interesting point because a lot of people will look at the business and, yeah, for example, one of the criticisms is why list altcoins? And, and as I said, it doesn't bother me too much. Look, I'm not a fan of them, but I understand there's that competitive pressure. Your customers want them. It is a revenue stream. I get it. And, and perhaps that's one of the pressures that comes with, you know, raising you know, half a billion dollars in that you, you know, you have a fiduciary duty to, to grow your company, right? So, but for you personally, what, what kind of pressures come with raising that kind of money? Because I've got no idea. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting question. So, look, I think sometimes people maybe envision it as, um, 
you know, you have this board and once you take their money, they're going to pressure you. And I, I think there are companies where that's true because um, there are a lot of examples of VCs that have come into companies and just, you know, exited the founders or like leaned really hard on them. Um, one thing we've been fortunate at Coinbase is that we, you know, Frederick and I were able to maintain a lot of control over the company, um, founder control. And so there was never a dynamic that we felt where we were like being pressured by the board. And I, I don't think, you know, they, the kind of people we brought onto the board, they wouldn't have done that anyway. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like they were leaning on us, like you better do this or you're out or anything like that. But at the same time, um, you know, when you raise venture capital, you're doing it because you're trying to grow a big company. And Fred Erstman and I wanted to grow a big company, right? Um, that was kind of what we set out to do. So, you know, I believe that all the decisions to add new coins, you know, um, really came from us. I don't recall anybody on the board ever coming to us and saying, hey, you have to do this or like, what are you guys thinking? We just wanted to build, we just wanted to provide what our customers wanted and what they were asking for. And, um, you know, that's mainly how it's done. So I would say if you want to, if somebody wants to build more of like a lifestyle business um, that's not like under some pressure to eventually get big, um, venture capital may not be the right thing. But in our case, we wanted to build a big company and we wanted to grow faster and we wanted to um, throw a fuel on the fire. So, yeah. But does it come with any other pressures? Like, do you feel a pressure of having to like achieve some some kind of goal or target because you've raised so much money? Um, let's see. I mean, there is some pressure in the sense that, um, people start to watch your valuation, right? And yeah. the employees, the employees that you have joining the company as well, they're, they're owners in the business. They're getting options, um, with a strike price, right? And so they want to know if I join and the strike price is this, you know, what is it going to be in two years? What is it going to be in four years when these options vest? So I think there's some pressure from that point of view. Um, also, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do feel like some obligation as like a steward of people's capital, right? Like if you're going to raise um, that, that fiduciary duty, if you're going to raise money from other people, they're doing that because you have kind of an, a mutual agreement that mm -hmm. we're going to try to make this thing big and, and not only return the money to you, but um, hopefully grow something much bigger beyond that. So if you don't have a goal of like trying to become a bigger company, you probably shouldn't raise money from, from VCs. Like that's, that just wouldn't be in integrity, I don't think. Yeah. And I guess it's interesting you say uh, like a steward and obli the obligations that come with that, because you do you're building a business in this kind of weird world where it's you're also building on top of this weird new decentralized money um, and specifically towards Bitcoin. People are very passionate about it. And do you feel do you feel like you're a steward of Bitcoin? Do you feel obligations toward Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, I feel like um, this, look, we've, I've built this company off of this protocol, which uh -huh. I didn't invent, right? Yeah. Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever that is, or a group of people, they are the ones, you know, who kind of created this amazing innovation in the world. Um, I, think, I think I'm helping by giving more people access to it, but I definitely don't feel like we're shaping Bitcoin or something like that. Like we are kind of more like in service to the, the customers and the community of people who want to use it. Um, so... I, and I think it's obviously it's, for us, it's broader, too. It's, it's a cryptocurrency thing. It's we're trying to be agnostic since our customers want all kinds of different things. Um, but, yeah, we definitely have some sense of responsibility there.